<coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, 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 we would have a symposium on peripheral vascular disease. I have to be frank. But this is a future. I don't have any question about it. And I think what I'm going to be presenting to you today, I think, is going to convince more those who have been skeptical that this is a very important field. Well, my title is Imagenomics Throughout the Lifespan from the Legs uh, to the Brain. Let me say you what happened. About 10 years ago, I have some existential kind of a crisis. And I thought, you are really working with disease that is already developed, trying to understand it, but we are not really knowing, we know much less of what's, what is health, what it makes us healthy. So I moved from this field in the bottom, arterial disease to the top. And then I began to work on three different populations, you know, children from, age, uh, from birth to age 20, age 20 to 60, and age 60 to 100. But most importantly, when you get into a new field, and this is the field of health, you have to con always use new technology, the most advanced technology. You cannot just be saying this is health means the technology is not important. So we got into imaging, genomics, artificial intelligence, new therapeutics, that is, what are the defense mechanisms that we can enhance and be therapies of the future? In heart failure, the new drugs, SGLT2s, all these drugs are enhancing defense mechanisms that have been found in health. That's the future. And then the issue of a cell that circulates in blood called monocyte, that you can really get the genetics of an individual with that cell. So I'm going to start H20 to 60. Before I do this, let me present to you where the data is coming from. It's about 2010 that I became involved with what is the NHLBI in Spain, in Madrid. And we developed a project of 4,000 people, over 4,000 people, 1,500 women, aged 40 to 54 years, that we are following for 20 years. The following is very deep, is every three years, we have the most enhanced technology that you can imagine. We begin with ultrasound of the large arteries, uh, uh, positron emission tomography, magnetic resonance imaging of the arteries, and so forth. And we have linked these two risk factors to start with. That's number one. And then number two to uh, genetics. Let me start with the first one and let me present to you the main three findings that we had with the use of imaging and risk factor profile. Then we'll say something about genetics. What we did is we developed technology of 2D and 3D ultrasound to look at the carotids the main aorta and the iliofemoral region. And then what do you do with the coronaries? Well, indirectly, you know, the CT calcium score. And I'm not going to go into the details because we spent three years in developing such technology. And with 3D, for example, we can measure in cubic millimeters what is the amount of disease that is in this arterial system. So number one, let's see what we found in 4,000 people, age 40 to age 55. Look at the bottom. The disease begins in the iliofemoral region. And in fact, this is what we found with two different studies. The first study is the one I am presenting, near 4,000 patients, so-called PESA study. When you look at the three systems, you find that the largest or the most important one is the iliofemoral region, with disease in 52% of people uh, in this PESA study. Then we move into general motors study, which is the AWHAs, very similar. So when you look at the large arteries, and we're looking at subclinical disease with ultrasound, you begin to realize that the femoral region is important. Then what we did is we compare males with females in the PESA study, the one near 4,000 people. And here you have uh, men have the disease more significant uh, compared with carotid disease and so forth, and coronary disease more significant than women. But certainly, I think what is important is the next slide, in which we look how the disease, where the disease begins. And this is very tough because you get these people and you don't know when the disease has started, but 
Certainly you have a feeling age 40 to 44, 44 to 49, 50 to 54, men and this is women. The disease appears to start really in the femoral region, which is in blue, compared with the red. So this is a very important finding because now we are going to countries that cannot afford uh, expensive technology. And what we do is very simple. We scan the iliofemoral region. We look at the risk factor profile. We don't take blood. We don't take blood for glucose or cholesterol. We just look obesity, lack of exercise. More or less, it gives you a sense of the risk factor profile. So in half an hour, we can tell what is the risk of the individual. And the most important is the disease that you see directly. The risk factors is a statistical game. But to see the disease is not, means things are problematic. So this is very important for us, and that is to really focus in the iliofemoral region. Well, this is the data in general, males and women under age of uh, 55 years, and this is staggering. Two thirds of men have subclinical disease. One region of the two carotids, aorta, two iliofemorals, and the coronaries are six regions. So 21, one region, two or three, four, five or six. Two thirds of men and half of women under age of 50 years, actually. You see that here. Well, high incidence, therefore, of subclinical disease at this age. I have more to say because the, stars, the disease begins at age, at age 20 years. It actually begins earlier. The question is how it progresses. So we have done this every three years. And at six years, 33% of people have progression of disease. And actually, 7 to 10% have regression, interestingly. But 33% have progression. And then what is the role of risk factors at young age? Well, this is very interesting. Uh, I, can, I don't have the time to go into the details, but this is a study uh, blindly done in terms of outcomes and so forth. And for example, here is the iliofemoral region in disease that has progressed just over six years. And this is iliofemoral region, the disease has regressed. But what is most interesting is the risk factors, and this is very new. When we look at LDL cholesterol and hypertension, the progression of disease is much faster if you have these risk factors at younger age, 40 to 45, he's more than 60. So what we are now learning, not only we have subclinical disease that begins early in life, but we're also learning that the risk factors early in life have much more impact than it is progression. And now I'm going to present to you a second finding, which is quite important. This is the CARDIA study. We were able to get the data from a study of near 5,000 people that were tabulated age 20 to age 40, a little bit earlier. And what we did is we look at the risk factors, how they progress over a 20 year period. This is very simple. This is the area. You see, in the, here you have 20 years, and here you have the LDL cholesterol level. So basically, at the very end, you say a formula that looks at the area. This is actually blood pressure, HDL cholesterol, etc. And the question is, what happened 20 to 40 years later? That's the point. These were very young people. And this is very striking. We just published this. And that is LDL cholesterol. You know the red is the area was larger than here in the bottom at age 20 to 40 when you look at the LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, blood pressure. So what we are now learning, not only the disease begins early, but it's very troublesome because the events come later, but the whole thing cooked between age 20 and 40. And people say at age 50, you know, all these guidelines are completely primitive. I mean, age 40, 50, do a Framingham, 10, 20 years. They don't look at the disease, they look at the game, which is the risk factor, which is important. But anyway, this is what we learn, and this is number two. So the disease starts early, and the risk factor profile is very significant. But now comes the most interesting finding, and that is, what is the normal LDL cholesterol? Just focus here. If you go to the guidelines, between 1920, this is normal, somebody who didn't have cardiovascular events, but look, this is a clinical disease. What happened is there was no technology to look at what really goes on in the arterial system. So everything was heart attacks, strokes, and so forth. But now going to diabetes, for example, the pre-diabetic is here. And you say it's an alarm system for diabetes. Well, it's not an alarm system, it's big trouble. The disease is already there. But even more, before 
the hemoglobin A1C is the resistance, insulin resistance, and it's here. This is being before prediabetes. So what we are learning now, even the risk factors, we have been foolish by saying this is normal. Nothing is normal when you look at subclinical disease. And I'm showing you, you know, show in a moment, the progression of disease predicts events, and the presence of disease very early predicts events later on, as we show in the cardiac study. So with all of this together, we decided to develop a trial, primary preventive coronary artery disease trial, the sole pre-card, in which people between age 20 and 39 years, they will consider to be abnormal if the LDL cholesterol is more than 70. So I'm not going to the details of the trial. Uh, we're going to use a subcutaneous approach of uh, lipid lowering twice a year. And in the group that is actually the active group, and here is the control group. I don't want to go into the details, and even I will tell you we have data now, very clear data, that the progression of the disease, which is what the primary endpoint dictates events later in life. So without going any further, i like to say one word about genetics. Everything I mentioned to you is about the tremendous impact that imaging is going to have in us in terms of preventing disease. Let's, let's talk about genetics, and you know, I have so much to say, but I just summarize in a single slide what we are learning. And see if you understand this. There is a war. The war is between the bone marrow and the substrate in the artery. Any foreign body calls white cells to take care of that. Maybe a bacteria, maybe a virus, maybe cholesterol. We focus on cholesterol, and we did a study in which I'm not presenting here now, but we look at the positron emission tomography, how the bone marrow activates cells when there is substrate of cholesterol in the arteries. This is already published, but let me now go into further aspects. We did positron emission tomography in 900 individuals of the 4,000 of the PESA study, and then we did magnetic resonance imaging. And very fascinating, what we actually see, this is activity of disease. You know what that means? That means that the monocytes from the bone marrow are trying to take the cholesterol out. And if they win, they be, the lesions become fibrotic. This is exactly what happens. We can detect in the peripheral circulation when there is activity, when there is healing. And actually, this is calcification all about. Calcification is healing when you see the arteries have a higher calcium score. There's no activity, it's just healing, but it's telling you that there has been trouble there. So this is what we are learning. Well, let me just summarize something that I could spend half an hour and I don't have the time. What we are seeing is the following. When the substrate cholesterol in the artery is not high, hypertension makes LDL to get in. Smoking gets LDL to get into the artery. High LDL, obviously. When you have a substrate that is not very significant, these lesions become fibrotic. Now comes, the, now comes the problem, and that is, what about if the substrate is significantly high? And this is number two. If the substrate is significantly high, the monocytes commit suicide. They cannot do the job. And during that process, they release tissue factor metalloproteinases that lead to plaque rupture. So what we are now beginning to understand the coronary syndromes, and that this is a failure of the defense mechanism that actually the war is won by the substrate. And the defense mechanism commits suicide. This is very well known in science, the apoptotic phenomena. Any cell with apoptosis release trouble, release toxins. Go to COVID. COVID is a foreign body, it's a virus. And what happened? The patient begins to have shortness of breath from the unit, goes to the intensive unit, mechanical support. What is actually happening is that the cells that are supposed to take care of the virus lose the bottle, and then they release all the substances that is, are in the literature that put the patient in big trouble. Thrombotic phenomena with tissue factor release and so forth. So what I'm presenting to you is a biological phenomena that really applies to any foreign body that gets into our body. If the substance is small, you win. If not, you have this. But something else we have learned, and this is the concept of cheap. What is cheap? Very interesting. Basically, the cells from the bone marrow that I mentioned, they may have mutations. 
That means you have a defense mechanism that cannot do the job. And this is a new race factor. Let me tell you, we have the data. Uh, in these 900 people, in 35%, CHIP is already, the monocytes already have mutations that make the monocytes not to work. A huge risk factor that you are going to see in the literature more and more. And we are now can address the genes that are affected, we begin to know them. For example, T, T2, and so forth. I don't want to go into the details. What I'm really presenting to you is by understanding health and the defense mechanisms, we are now beginning to understand disease. And if you are understanding that, new therapies will be in the future. Well, anyway, I don't want to go any further, but perhaps I will summarize the first part of my presentation. Uh, I call this a pause because many times you go on and on and on, but let's put things together. First, critical, early identification of disease. Imaging is going to be critical. The iliofemoral region is going to be critical. Then you have the risk factors you have to modify, and certainly people who know they are developing the disease, I suspect will be much more sensitized to take care of the risk factors at much earlier age. In terms of gene variants, early identification of genes, we already do this with LDL, cholesterol, and many other aspects. Cheap or clonal hematopoiesis is going to be critical in the risk factor profile in the near future, and not difficult, actually, to measure from the circulating monocyte. It is what, actually, we are doing. Well, this is actually what I presented. But now I go into the second issue, even more exciting to me, and that is what happens to the brain with all of this. There was no technology, no technology. You couldn't measure flow in the brain. You couldn't measure uptake of glucose in the brain and so forth. And this is what we began to do. And I'm, this is part of my presentation. This is why from, I say from the legs to the brain. So we are up there now. Alzheimer over 100 years ago said, the disease is a disease, my disease is a disease of the arteries. He was a pathologist. And the question is, you should read that, it's amazing. The question is, why is a disease of the arteries and everybody's trying to get Alzheimer's new drugs and so hold to the neuron? There's a lot of things that have been missed. That's the reality. Now I'm going to show you data, which I think is very fascinating. The hypothesis was developed actually in 2020. We have the TANSNIP study between New York and Madrid. And that is, this is the hypothesis was developing. The large vessel, the large vessel disease, which is what I presented a minute ago, and risk factors may lead to microvascular disease of the brain. Why? Because the pathologists have some feeling that this is what is happening. If you have microvascular disease of the brain, can you measure flow? And if the flow is decreased, what happens with the uptake of metabolites such as glucose? If with positive emission tomography, this is decreased, now it goes to the third project. Is this affecting cognitive function? And with all of this, what happens with Alzheimer's disease or degenerative brain disease? Well, we work on this between 2020 and actually 2022. And I'm presenting to you the data, actually. We started with 96 people, 59 were women. With, um, we, with this uh, with it, uh, flow with MRI, and those of you who are in MRI know what I'm talking about. And what you can do by mapping, you can see in red the lack or decrease of blood flow to the brain. And what we began to see that there was association between significant risk factors, particularly hypertension not treated, in the decrease of flow to the brain. Then what we did, we went into positive emission tomography. Is decreasing flow decreasing the uptake of glucose to the brain? We published this in 2021. Cardiovascular risk is associated with brain hypometabolism, particularly with hypertension. Several areas showing hypometabolism, including those known to be affected in dementia, in Alzheimer's. This is very interesting. You, you see, that uptake of glucose is decreased, but if you go to the regions, these are the regions that cognitive dysfunction has been attributed to senile dementia in Alzheimer's disease. Well, this is number two. In number th and here's actually the example of what was published. This is Framingham. More risk factors, lower is the uptake of uh, glucose, and this is in red, and this is high blood pressure, not, not treated, it's the same thing. The question is, if you have decreasing blood flow to the, to the brain, which you detected by spin labeling MRI, 
Is this then in let less glucose uptake? Is this then affecting cognitive function? We are working on this in a blind manner at this moment. I don't have the data, but this is the third step, of course. Well, we got very excited about all of this, and we began to think about Alzheimer's disease, and I don't want to go into much detail, just to say that we have an animal model, a mouse model of, of Alzheimer. And this mouse model actually develops Alzheimer's in a very interesting, in a, you know, it's very interesting. They are in cages, and you can open a door and if you have a good brain, you get out. But the development of Alzheimer's in this mouse model is they, they open the door and they, they don't find it. It's when you begin to see that there is something going on. They develop this disease spontaneously. It's not that somebody says, these guys are doing something wrong with these animals. It's not. It's, this is actually uh, a, a model. And again, actually, the data was published just a few weeks ago in the, in the British Journal of Pharmacology. But let me tell you what we found, which is interesting. We found small clots in the tiny arteries of the brain. And actually, this is uh, the amyloid that gets deposited in the brain in Alzheimer's. Before, before the deposited in the brain is in the blood, and this is procoagulant. So then we, we gave Pradaxa that we use for atrial fibrillation. And the, the level in blood of Pradaxa is the same that we have in humans. So it was not that you give an instrument and we were preventing the progression of the disease. This was just published. So the question that we have is, when Alzheimer's years ago said, my disease is a disease of the arteries, what he's talking about, what I said at the beginning, risk factors and so forth may affect the arteries, by, and you see this Im in imaging with the large arteries, and the tiny arteries actually is hyperplasia of the media. It's not atherosclerotic disease. Or he was seeing clots. And actually, in his writings, he doesn't describe what it is in the artist, so we do not know, but this is very interesting. With all of this, and this is research, we found something was missing here because of all these individuals that we did all these imaging technologies, was not the same individual who we did flow with the same that we did uptake of glucose. So in a way, you say, you really are, you are in the hypothesis, but you don't have the same individual that is being followed. And this is what we started in 2022, the so-called, this is the second study. The first was the pre-cut that I mentioned on the other aspect of young people with high HDL. This is the second, the LDL. This is study is a study of 1,000 participants, age 55, 60% are men. And here, everybody has actually all the technologies. And these patients are being followed now are going to be followed for 20 years. But I want to present you the, the data that we got, actually four days ago, was published in The Lancet. And it's fascinating, the first comparison of what happened to the same individual when you look at imaging of the brain and you continually follow. Before I mention the data, NFL, we now have biomarkers in blood, like troponin, when there is injury of the heart, high sensitive troponin. Now we have biomarkers with this minor injury of the brain. And this, for example, NFL, neurofibrils, are from the neurons. And with this minor injury, they are releasing the blood. This is the fibrils of the neurons, and we can detect this in the blood. So uh, I'm going to present to you the data in a single or two slides. This is basically middle-aged asymptomatic individuals with persistent uh, 370 people with persistent high risk of cardiovascular disease and subclinical carotid atherosclerosis, we show brain metabolic decline. We deposit an emission tomography twice, and we found uh, a problem. And this problem is here. And what we found, you see, in red is the uptake of glucose on these individuals at baseline. This is the uptake. This is mapping, statistical mapping of glucose when you have the follow-up just at four years. So, in fact, what, we are, what I have been saying to you, that we did a spot study, not everybody had the same technologies. Now we have, we are repeating, and for the first time we see something that is very real. And these are risk factors, and hypertension is a very important one. So, in fact, what I like to tell you today is that if you are interested on the legs, be interested on the head because it does goes all together. 
In fact, I already presented to you, as the disease begins in the large arteries, this is beginning to be affected. And you know what is troublesome? We are finding this in relatively young people. So cognitive dysfunction, senile dementia, and even uh, Alzheimer's, we believe, and this is the study, that actually cooks very early in life with risk factors that have not been affected. The three main risk factors we saw were hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. These are the three risk factors that affect the large vessels, and we are now beginning to see the consequences by imaging of what happened with the vein eventually. So what I would say is, first, we have to early identify the disease if we are dealing with the brain. It's the same thing in the large arteries. You can already begin to predict what might be happening in the brain in many years afterwards in some people. Imaging of external arteries, risk factor modification. But now there is something that really has been very striking to me. We all have patients who come to us and they say, doctor, you, you, are, you are a torture. You want me to stop smoking, you want me to lose weight, you want me to do, and so forth. I prefer to die suddenly, nobody bothers me. Say, well, <laughs> this is easy to say, die suddenly, <laughs> with all the, but you know what? If you tell these people, you know your brain, you don't die suddenly, but your risk factors can affect the brain in a chronic basis, they change drastically. I had three patients this month. They change, I don't know if this is going to persist, but what I can tell you, the reaction to our patients to talk about the brain, they are much more sensitive today than talking about the heart. And that's an issue that I have seen again and again. So cardiac patients are very sensitized to the brain, the cardiac patients. Then eventually we might have brain imaging and biomarkers. This is expensive. So at this moment, I don't want to move forward, but certainly in the first part of my presentation, the device that look at the leg, it will be available for the public in the next two years, three years or so forth. And I think will be the beginning to see you are in trouble. Now, having said that, I would say to you, and I am not presenting this today, that we reached the conclusion of what we found here between age 20, 60, risk factors in the large arteries, what we are finding age 60 to 100 later on in life is telling us something, that unless we go into education and start very early, I think we are wasting our time. I really felt, in fact, because about 10 years ago that I began to, I became very skeptical and I had been very involved with the American Heart Associations and all these associations, you know, I have been very involved, but I think it's a lot of talk but there is not a lot of substance. Really what has changed our lives are drugs, statins, you know, and so forth. But I don't think we are changing our lives by going somebody age 60, framing them 30 years, see what happened, and then you take care of yourself. I think we have to go to children. And we have a lot of data. Maybe next year you can invite me to talk about children. You will say, well, this is a, this is a symposium about the arteries and, and, and so forth and the legs. Why are you talking about the children? Well. I would be interested, you might be interested to present you the data because the data in children is fascinating. We are teaching children age three to six, 50,000 around the world. And I can tell you, they capture what you tell them. And we expect that later in life, this will be effective. Because if you look at yourself today, what you saw at age three to six, seven, eight, has an influence in your behavior today. So we are really focusing on something that it may be very superficial to you, but certainly is not to us. This is all science, but ends up, I think, in education. So I just finish by saying that we have done a lot of work between age 20, 60, 60 and 100, and here is, uh, is actually uh, in the first 20 years of life, we are doing a lot of studies there. And what we are learning is that earlier you start, the potential benefits, lower cost, compared with later in life, which is what I and you are working on. Higher is the cost and less is the benefit. And this is the reality that we are facing today. So I just finished by saying, first, thank you, PK, by giving me this opportunity. I, I feel excited, as you see, about all these things. But I feel very sensitized to the, your specialty because we are now beginning to see that that's where the whole thing starts. The thing, your arteries are very large and you don't have symptoms until the very end and you see them. But you know what? At age 20, age 25, this is beginning in the iliofemoral region. And I think this is where we should focus actually in the near future. Thank you very much.